Have you ever heard of a man known as the White Devil? Imagine a big white guy with a distinctive Boston accent. He doesn't appear to fit the mold of an Asian gangster. Yet, upon closer inspection, you might notice his tattoos that tell a different story. He thrived in a world of extortion, prostitution and brutal assaults, activities that seemed to be his forte. He went on to not only join, but also ascend within the ranks of Boston's Chinatown gangs, confounding all expectations. But how did he manage to navigate a world so different from his own and become a prominent figure in organised crime? This is the story of The White Devil, a name he earned for his remarkable journey into Boston's Chinatown gangs. Meet John Willis, born on May 11, 1971. He's known as Bak Gwai John in Cantonese, or the famously White Devil. Believe it or not, he's an American gangster connected to the Chinese Mafia in both Boston and New York. What's truly unbelievable is that Willis insists he's the only white individual who managed to get involved in Chinese organised crime. It's a claim that even caught the attention of FBI agent Scott O'Donnell, who confessed he had never seen anything quite like the enigma of Willis. Get ready as we dive deeper in his story. Stay tuned at the end of this video. But how did he end up here? Well, let's rewind and understand what he went through. Imagine a childhood shadowed by an abusive, alcoholic father who collected money for the Irish mob. One night, his father's violent actions forced him to flee, leaving behind his wife and young Willis, just three years old at the time, as he sought refuge in North Carolina. The abandonment ignited a blazing anger within Willis, a fire that he tried to temper, channeling it into hockey on better days. Willis was raised by his mother in Dorchester in the 1970s. The twists of fate didn't ease up. Just a year later, his mother's battle with diabetes led to the amputation of both her legs. At the tender age of 13, Willis took on the role of her caregiver, shouldering adult responsibilities. Tragedy struck again when he was just 14. His mother's sudden passing due to a heart blockage left him utterly alone. His remaining family, two half-sisters consumed by drug addiction, were unable to provide the support he so desperately needed. Imagine the struggle of a young man left to fend for himself in his deceased brother's icy home. No food, no heating, just bone-chilling cold and gnawing hunger. But the story takes a turn. Willis, who was determined to defend himself, discovered weightlifting and drugs, growing into a huge adolescent driven by simmering wrath. At just 16, his appearance defied his age, earning him a bouncer role near Fenway Park. It was a busy place, especially popular with the Asian community, which he was advised to avoid because of its connections to organised crime. However, fate frequently pursues its own plan. Chaos broke out one fateful night and a Chinese guy was doused in incapacitating mace. Willis became an unlikely hero at that very moment. He boldly intervened, courageously subduing the aggressor, caring for the injured man's eyes and ending the conflict. This unanticipated act revealed the injured man to be none other than Vapeng Zhou, a young gangster who was genuinely grateful for Willis's intervention. His gratitude manifested in the form of a contact card, an invitation to reach out should the need arise. In just days, Willis's luck plummeted, leaving him with only 76 cents. Desperate, he walked snowy streets to his half-sister, but found rejection. Alone and cold, he dialed Joe's number on a card, hoping for help. Within minutes, two BMWs arrived, carrying stylish men. Undeterred by Joe's absence, Willis's determination led him into an uncertain journey. These enigmatic figures ushered him into the world of the Pingon Gang, an Asian criminal syndicate dictating the pulse of illicit gambling dens and hidden parlours in Boston. Inside, the house overflowed with life, men, women and children who embraced him as one of their own. The warmth of hospitality enveloped him, nourishing both body and soul with sustenance, $500 and a place to rest. As dawn broke, his transformation unfolded. His appearance, belongings and even his identity underwent a remarkable change. 
Tailored suits adorned him. A pager and a bulky cell phone hung from his waist, and his hair was meticulously styled into the distinctive spikes synonymous with the Ping-On gang. This shift was surreal, a stark departure from his modest beginnings as a neglected child who once sought solace by the oven's warmth. The speed at which he became integrated into this makeshift family left him astonished. These were individuals he had encountered just days prior, yet they embraced him as kin. When summoned to New York for training under the Hung Moon, a faction gang closely connected to Ping On, he stopped attending school and entered New York City's thriving Chinatown, where he became enmeshed in a foreign language and culture. English seemed to vanish amidst the strange sounds and customs. Willis felt like a fish out of water, having trouble using chopsticks and feeling out of place at the karaoke clubs where his fellow gang members found solace. Willis was dispatched to New York to serve as a bodyguard and bagman for a Chinese criminal there after being introduced to gang life in Boston. In order to meet Asian ladies while living in New York, Willis started learning Chinese, Cantonese and Tuasanese dialects, and eventually became fluent. His advancement within the Chinese organized criminal hierarchy depended heavily on his linguistic abilities. Willis later picked up Vietnamese as well. However, his gang initiation was far from superficial. It involved more than melodious harmonies and genteel ceremonies. He found himself wielding a gun, practicing his skills within the confines of a slaughterhouse. It wasn't long before he was handed his first assignment, a series of robberies orchestrated for the notorious Lao brothers. His initial venture was marred by inexperience. Storming into a sweatshop, he encountered a hail of bullets, narrowly escaping with his life. Undeterred, this near miss only fueled his determination, intensifying his drive to refine his abilities and amplify his fierceness. News began to circulate about the Boston's new white guy, a formidable figure fueled by steroids, strength, and an unyielding temper. Two years within New York's labyrinth saw Willis transform into Back Guai John, a moniker resonating with fear and reverence, a testament to his Caucasian origins. Graduating from training, 1990 beckoned him back to Boston, where he worked for a mid-level gangster named Bai Ming, a gambling den kingpin vulnerable to Molotov-wielding adversaries. However, a Chinese turf war broke out, which resulted in Bai Ming being the most important gangster left standing in Boston's Chinatown. Willis, by virtue of being Bai Ming's second-in-command, saw his status in Chinese organized crime skyrocket. In his role as Ming's right-hand man, Willis shouldered extraordinary responsibilities. From pouring tea to inspecting for bombs and even accompanying Ming to the bathroom, his duties were anything but ordinary. Ming reciprocated this loyalty with mentorship, imparting lessons in respect, discipline, and the cardinal rule of steering clear of drug-related ventures. One evening outside Ming's gambling den, Willis stood beside a prominent Ping-On figure when a lone gunman emerged, ending a life in an instant. Witnessing the aftermath, with life extinguished and blood pooling, Willis suddenly became the target. Remarkably, the gun malfunctioned, sparing his life and seeding an unwavering belief in his own invincibility. Yet, the allure of wealth beckoned, leading Willis to dabble in drug deals. Starting with small amounts of marijuana, his involvement expanded to encompass significant quantities of pot and cocaine. During an incarceration, fate dealt him a hand that would reshape his destiny, introducing him to a Florida-based supplier of Oxy, a potent opioid behind countless addictions and deaths. Upon release, he assembled a team, secured a mansion on Pompano Beach's shores, and orchestrated a complex operation involving substituting vitamins with Oxy, selling them at a hefty markup in Cape Cod. This success came at the grim expense of lives entangled in opioid addiction. Within just two years, he distributed over 260,000 pills, accruing $4 million, although he claims the figure was much higher. His wealth was manifested in speedboats, motorcycles, luxury cars, nightclubs, and opulent mansions, a tableau painted by illicit gains. Amid this opulence, he found companionship with Anne Nguyen, a woman 13 years his junior 
and her daughter, Mai Lin, whom he cherished as his own. In 2000, Willis was convicted and jailed for extortion. He received a five-year sentence for dealing heroin. While in prison, Willis organized an OxyContin trafficking ring from Florida to Massachusetts. Upon his release from prison, he became heavily involved in drug dealing and money laundering against the wishes of his Chinese organized crime peers. With a more discreet approach, Willis might have extended his grip on the opioid crisis. Yet, restraint eluded him. Immersed in newfound wealth, he recklessly flaunted it, drawing unwanted attention. In 2010, a visit to a Cambridge brothel, coupled with a bag of marijuana, inadvertently attracted FBI surveillance already focused on the establishment's owner. This marked the turning point as the FBI scrutinized Willis, tracked his conspicuous moves, and built a compelling case that would seal his destiny. First hinting at the net closing around him, Willis was pulled over while driving his Bentley without a license, $100,000 in cash in his possession. This encounter, while not leading to immediate arrest, signaled to him that his days of freedom were numbered. Months of meticulous investigation culminated in the arrest of one of his couriers, caught in the act of delivering oxy in Fort Lauderdale. March of 2011 saw the execution of a raid on his mansion, as 40 armoured officers descended, apprehending him amidst a cascade of firearms, cash and thousands of oxycodone pills. In August 2013, at the age of 42, Willis was convicted of drug trafficking and money laundering for his role in the $4 million OxyContin drug ring. He received a 20-year sentence and stripped him of his prized possessions, a 38-foot speedboat, luxury cars and millions of dollars. Yet, beyond the drug charges, a constellation of illicit activities came to light, revealing the extent of Willis's involvement in the criminal underworld. Willis will reflect on his tumultuous journey, a tragic chapter of his life laid bare. He is currently serving his sentence at Federal Correctional Institution in Maryland, a medium security US federal prison for men, and he will be released on June 10th, 2028. Thank you for making it this far. Let me know in the comments what you think of this incredible story, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel and leave a like if you enjoyed the video, and we'll see you next time on the channel.